So I'm going to ask the question again. How many of you have picked a company for your project? Okay, we're getting close. That's good. Okay. So again, if you haven't picked it by the end of this week, please do so. So you've got a group, you've got a project, you should be ready to roll. So in the last session, I said some mean things about ESG. <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to take them back. Um, um, and, and let me review where we were. The, the, the selling point for ESG is if you're good, you're going to be a more valuable company. It's good for your revenue, it's good for your earnings, good for your cash flows. And that's fine. I can give you anecdotal evidence of companies that are good that have done well. I can also give you anecdotal evidence of companies that are bad that have done well. But I think the real question is, is this true across the cross section? If you looked across companies rather than individual companies and right now the evidence, on whether ESG helps you in terms of, as a company deliver better results. The results are at best mixed and at worst non-existent. So ESG doesn't help you grow faster. ESG doesn't make you more profitable. ESG doesn't even make you less risky. Maybe the only evidence you can argue that is good for ESG is if you're a bad company, it could come back to bite you. It could hurt you in terms of perhaps being able to raise capital. The second big sales pitch that ESG has also made is to investors. And what are investors told? If you invest in good companies, you will earn higher returns. Notice a pattern here. With every group, what's ESG saying? You can do ESG and at no cost, you'll make more money. You get, you know? I mean. Guys, if you've got your mic on and Zoom, please turn it off. So with, the, with investors, they're told you can be good and you can make higher returns. First, mathematically, that's impossible. And here's why. If I let you pick whatever stock you want in the universe and you made your optimal choice, and you can bring in whatever criteria you want. And then I took 500 stocks out of your universe and said, now pick your best portfolio. If you think in terms of optimization, a constrained optimal can never yield a better return than an unconstrained optimal. So already you're making a pitch that doesn't make sense. And here again, if you look at the evidence, it's all over the place. You find, for instance, studies that show that if you invest in bad companies, companies that are in casinos, you know, tobacco, you actually earn higher returns than if you invest in good companies. There are other studies in more recent years, especially in the last decade, supposedly favoring ESG, that do find that companies that score higher in ESG seem to make higher returns, but almost all of it comes from one segment to the market that ESG is overinvested. You know what that segment is? What type of companies do ESG funds tend to be overinvested in? Tech companies. Why? Because ESG scores have historically been weighted on fossil fuels, on carbon footprint. And let's face it, if you're a tech company, you already start off at, a, at an advantage. For a long time, Facebook was one of the most widely held ESG stocks. Why? Because it didn't have a much of a carbon footprint. If you take the tech out, the ESG premium that's there disappears. So if there are studies basically that cut across the spectrum. They're bad for investing, they're good for investing, they have no effect. And the bottom line is if you drill down just an ESG, there is no evidence that investing in good, good stocks will deliver a higher returns. So when I made this uh, pitch to a group of ESG advocates about six months ago, these are true believers. So we went through one by one, the reasons they had for ESG. So they said, well, ESG is good for companies. So we looked at the evidence and we decided it wasn't there. So, but that's okay. The ESG is good for investors. We went through the evidence and it wasn't there. So finally they said, it doesn't matter if it's good for companies or it's good for investors. 
it's good for society. That ultimately becomes a pitch, right? What does it matter whether investors gain or shareholders gain if society is made better off? So I want to look at that, that final issue is, are, is society better off when companies try to be good? I'm gonna argue that it makes you feel better when you force companies to be good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that society is better off. In fact, there are three phenomena that I think you need to think about when you push companies to be good and you measure their goodness. The first is the well-known phenomenon of greenwashing. You know what that is? Basically, companies learn what will give them a high ESC score, and then they do the kabuki dance of, hey, look how good we are. That's as, that's as old as time. You create a measurement device, people game the device. Maybe we can get around that, right? Look, look past the greenwashing. Here's a second problem, though. When you force a company to get rid of what you think are bad assets, what do you think happens to those assets? You heard of Engine One? Engine One is um, an activist investing group who's focused on social good, especially on carbon footprint. They took a position in ExxonMobil and they actually pulled off a coup. They managed to get ExxonMobil to sell off some of its fossil fuel reserves. Win, right? When you sell reserves, I use the word sell, somebody's buying these reserves. Who do you think is buying all this bad stuff? You're getting companies to get rid of. You know that private equity investors in the last decade have invested more than a trillion dollars in fossil fuel reserves. You know what you're doing? You're getting Exxon Mobil, you're putting pressure on them to sell the reserves and who are they selling them to? To the people that you would least want to develop these reserves because they don't even have the restraints that a Royal Dutch or an Exxon Mobil will have. So if you think you're fighting for climate change by getting oil companies to sell off or divest the reserves, ask yourself where those reserves go. And whether in fact, 10 years from now, you're going to wake up with less fossil fuel production or more. You know what percentage of energy came from fossil fuels 10 years ago? About 80%. You know what percentage of energy came from fossil fuels last year? About 80%. Doesn't sound like we're making a tangible difference in the things we claim we need to make a difference on because with ESG, we're just pushing stuff behind the curtain. We don't see it anymore, but guess what? It's still happening. And there's one final thing that I think we all, and this is, a, this is each of us has to ask ourselves. We're in a sense outsourcing our consciences, right? We want, I mean, let's face it, we all share a common objective. We want to make the world a better place. But that requires inconvenience. It requires that we bear costs. And none of us wants to do that. ESE offers you a very convenient way of saying, hey, you can drive your SUV, take a long flight across the Atlantic, come back, and then you get home and you buy an ESC fund and everything is okay. It essentially allows us to escape by taking these acts that look good, but essentially allows us to go back to living our lives. So let me summarize where I am on ESG. If you look at ESG and, and, and any objective function built around, why can't we bring society into the business? Think through the consequences like every other objective and ask yourself, is this where you want it to be at the end of the process? There's plenty more I could say about ESG, but I, you know, I'm going to leave it there. But I'll, you know, you've read the posts I have on ESG, and in fact, it's part of what I call the theocratic trifecta: ESG, sustainability, and stakeholders. 
all of which have become part of the discussion. And we can't let people just get away with something because it sounds good, because it looks like you're doing something moral and good for society without asking what are the real consequences. So let's see where we are. We decided that just maximizing stock price could get us into trouble, all those leakages. We look for other objectives, maybe revenue, market share, earnings growth. And let's face it, each of those objectives comes with its own downside. It's a Hubbard maximizing stakeholder one. And I said, do you want every company to look like a research university? It's kind of a mind boggling and scary concept. So now what do we do? So I'm gonna bring you back full circle to maximizing stock prices and why I think it still makes sense to stick with that objective. If you think about what makes maximizing stock prices kind of break down, it's that managers put their interests often above shareholder interests. Lenders get ripped off if they, if they don't protect themselves. Managers lie to financial markets and markets not always rational and cool and there are social costs and benefits. My argument for a market-based system is if you let it play out, it's self-correcting. And here's what I mean by that. If managers take enough advantage of shareholders, at some point in time, there's a backlash. We'll look at what the backlash looks like. If you exploit lenders, at some point in time, there's a backlash. If you lie to financial markets, at some point in time, and if you let the backlash play up, the system corrects itself. So let's start with the first. Let's start with the first of these issues. Let's assume that your shareholders in a company and I'm the manager. Remember all the different ways managers could put their interests over shareholder interest. I could do big acquisitions, overpay. I could be, put big compensation contracts and let the board vote on it, but the board's a rumba stamp. Every time I do one of these things, you're getting a little more pissed off as a shareholder, right? Now, initially you say, I'm just pissed off, but there's nothing I can do. And you get more and more and more pissed off. There's a critical mass of getting pissed off. Well, finally, you're pissed off enough. It's like the movie Network. If you've never seen it, the character in the movie finally opens with it. I, you know, basically, yes, he's tired of the whole thing and he's, you know, he's going to act. Now, you by yourself might not be able to act, but there are other people who then take advantage of your anger. Activist investors. I mean, if you think about Carl Icahn's and Bill Ackman's of the world, their strength is identifying companies where shareholders are really pissed off. And then they start to look for a coalition. A Carl Icahn knows that if he can draw on your votes, he can get management to change. We talked about how difficult it is to vote against management at an annual meeting. About 30, 35 years ago, activist investors discovered a way that they could get those proxies that you threw in the trash can or that you never voted and basically have a proxy fight where essentially they would go to shareholders and say, I know you're thinking about throwing your proxy in the trash can because you think you're helpless, but I'm willing to vote your proxy for you to change the way management is doing things. And if you're pissed off enough, guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna give me your pro proxy. So activist investors start popping up at these companies. When you see a company targeted by activist investors, like Kohl's right now, take a look at its history. You almost never see companies that are doing well, whose stock price is going up, getting targeted. It's almost always companies that have some issues with their operations and have had its stock price you know, dropping down. So you see act uh, no, act activist investors show up and shareholder meetings get more vocal. Instead of these passive meetings where you put an agenda out, you're gonna see more and more pushback. So I'll use again the example of what a typical target firm looks like in a hostile acquisition. 
the typical target firm in a hospital, and this is the ultimate backlash, right? Because you've managed your company so badly that now somebody's targeted your firm in an acquisition. Think about what happens in a hostile acquisition. You have one side, which is the hostile acquirer. You have the other side, which is the manager. And for once in your life, you as shareholders are the center of the universe, right? Both sides are appealing to you. What do the, man the incumbent managers tell you? Don't sell to that activist investor or that hostile acquirer because he's a bad guy. They're going to destroy the company. The hostile acquirer says, don't trust the incumbent managers. They don't care about you. And you get to decide who to trust. Every hostile acquisition is a test of how much you trust incumbent managers. So it's no surprise that when you look at companies that are targeted in hostile acquisitions, those companies tend to be companies where shareholders have lost trust in managers because managers put their interests over shareholder interests year after year after year. So I'm gonna use the example again. Of, of Disney to illustrate this. But when you see shareholders push back, you start to see boards become more responsive. And there is some evidence, if you look at the US, that boards of directors have become more responsive to shareholders. There are fewer insiders and in boards, boards have become smaller. There are more and more companies where CEOs are not the chairman of the board because shareholders have put pressure on them. There is evidence that if shareholders push back, usually with a big shareholder, with a big activist investor in the midst, that boards of directors become more responsive. So I'm going to take you back to Disney. Remember in 1997, I showed you the board of directors for Disney. Michael Eisner, Imperial CEO, had constructed a board of directors that effectively was a rubber stamp. At the time, he was he was in full power because Disney had done well for an extended period. But in 1996, one year before I showed you the board, Disney made a big acquisition. And keep this in mind, whenever a company does a big acquisition, what's the CEO doing? He's putting all his chips or her chips on the table saying, trust me, I know what I'm doing. This is going to be a great deal. And that's what Eisner did. He came in front of the board of directors and he said, I am going to buy ABC. He was very clear about this was not some collective judgment. I think ABC we know is a, is a good add-on. I think there's going to be lots of synergy. And I'm going to spend the money to do this thing. Huge deal relative to Disney's market cap. He put all his chips on the table. And unfortunately for him, the deal didn't work out. So after the deal, ABC's ratings tanked. You know, basically, who wants to be a millionaire was the only show that was drawing ratings to the show. So essentially, it was adding nothing to Disney's bottom line and costing them money. And this is a CEO who historically has put, he's basically never listened to shareholders. So already they came in, but they were willing to cut him slack when things were going well. But every year that things went badly, they were more and more pissed off. Remember we talked about the critical mass? You could see it building up at Disney. Between 96 and 99, Disney lost about half of its market cap. You know how difficult that was to do between 96 and 99? This is like a dot-com boom. Everybody else was going up without even trying in Disney management. It's quite an accomplishment. In fact, in 2003, two directors resigned from the board saying Michael Eisner was too autocratic. This is a big deal. This one of them happened to be Roy Disney. So there's kind of a symbolic response there. And in 2004, in perhaps the most insulting acquisition bid I've ever seen, Comcast made a hostile acquisition bid for Disney. And here's what made it insulting. Usually when you're a hostile acquirer and you want to buy a target company, you know what you do, right? You take the stock price and you offer a premium. That's how you do the acquisition. You know what Comcast did? They took the stock price and offered a discount. They said, you guys hate the management so much. You'd probably sell. The they never intended to carry out the hostile acquisition. This was really a message they were sending to Disney. This is how little we think of you as a company. And we just wanted to let you know. 
And of course, Eisner realized that the forces were gathering, that things were not going well. So his first response was to try to change the board of directors. He said, I'll make it less of a rubber stack concession. When you see CEOs make concessions, it's almost never done out of altruism. It's done because they're scared of some kind of backlash building. So he recreated the board. He made, um, I, I think he made George Mitchell the chairman of the board. He essentially tried to make changes to make the board of directors more responsive, but it was really too late. So he put in a corporate governance section. In fact, that year, I think in 2004, Disney added a corporate governance section to the annual report to tell us how much they cared about shareholders, all these things that they were changing. But the bottom line is by this time, the shareholders were well beyond being placated. They, they, were, they, they didn't care. In 2005, finally, the board of directors asked Eisner to leave. They basically said, you know, he, they claimed that he was retiring for his other interests, but the reality was that he was pushed. And when he got, when he was pushed out at Disney, he was replaced by a guy called Bob Iger. Now, usually when you see, you know, when you have democracies, often you replace one government head with somebody who looks, you know, the exact opposite. Often you move beyond. This is exactly what happened at Disney. When Michael Eisner was replaced and Iger was brought in, Iger was brought in because he was the anti-Eisner small ego, cared about consensus. And he came on with his own board of directors. And initially it was an extraordinarily independent board. It was small, it, you know, it had lots of people who'd push back. This looks like a happy ending to the story, right? In fact, once Iger came in, corporate, in terms of corporate governance course, Disney went from being at the bottom of the list to at the top of the list. People praised Disney for how responsive they were and how well they were handling things. And in 2012, um, sorry, 2011, Iger did something that was very impressive. He said, you know what? I want to arrange a transition because I'm not going to be CEO for life. And he told the board that they should find somebody in 2015 to replace him. So far, the story is going well. But here's where the story takes a turn. I think it was 2014, the board of directors went to Iger and said, you can't leave. You're far too critical for Disney's success. And when they first said that, he said, no, no, I'm not that important. Two weeks later, they came back and said, no, no, you are really the center of Disney's success. He said, no, 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 I'm not that critical. You ever see, you know, Red Julius Caesar? No. Well, basically, the first time they go to Caesar, you got to be king. And he says, no, 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 I'm not that important. The third time around, they put the crown on. Him. The same thing happens. At some point in time, you start believing people telling you how critical you are. And Iger said, you know what? For you, I will stay on. And I think it, it, it if you look at what's happened to Disney since, it created a chain of events that Disney is still dealing with. Because when people thought Iger was going to leave in 2015, there were a whole, you know, there was a range of people getting ready to move up in Disney. And when he pulled back, those people said, I'm not going to stick around here. Disney lost their next generation of top leadership when Iger decided to stay on. In fact, Iger finally did leave in 2020. Okay. But he left because at that, by that time, he was tired of staying around. My point is when CEOs stay on, no matter how good they were at the start, how much of a consensus builder that CEO might have been when they began, the longer you stay on, the more power you accumulate, and the more likely it is that you'll become an imperial CEO. I'm going to take a little tangent here and talk a little bit about why it matters. 
But that non-exit by Iger, I think, created a domino effect that Disney is still dealing with. The, when you look at who runs Disney now, who the CEO is, that story began when Iger chose not to leave because the board of directors made him stay on. February 2020, he was replaced as CEO by Bob Chap Chapek, who is essentially a numbers person who moved up Disney, ran the theme park division. We're still trying to figure out exactly where Bob's going to take the company. But my point is that, that CEOs, as they stay on, accumulate power. And as you accumulate power, boards of directors become more subservient to the CEO and corporate governance suffers. So I want to take a little tangent and ask the question, what's the right CEO for a company? And I'm going to use the corporate life cycle that I showed you in the first class to talk a little bit about what the characteristics are for somebody to be a great CEO. So you know, if you, listen, you know, read Harvard Business Review, they list all, these are the seven characteristics you need. As if there's one prototype for a great CEO. I'm gonna argue that you tell me where you are in the life cycle and I'll tell you what a great CEO would look like for you. If you're a young company, a startup or a young growth company, you want a visionary. Let's call that CEO Steve the visionary. Why? Because it's all about telling a story to markets and getting people to believe your story. As you go from startup to young growth, you want somebody who can build a business. It's not just telling a story. Now you've got to take the story and make it a business model. Let's call that CEO Paul the pragmatist. So in addition to having a vision, you're now able to convert that vision to a business model. You get past young growth, you're now building a business. You got to think about supply chains and production facilities and making sure that the trains run on time. So let's call that CEO, Bob the Builder. You're building a business. You get to be a growth company. You realize now easy growth is gone. You got to find growth wherever you can find it, a new product, a new geography. You need to be opportunistic. So CEO is now Oscar the opportunist. And then you become the C a mature company. You're just playing de defense, right? You got a big market. You're making a lot of money. Everybody's coming after you. You need a CEO who can play good D. And finally, when you get into decline, you want somebody who can liquidate your company. Basically doesn't think anything about making your company smaller. You tell me where in the life cycle, you can already see that the right kind of CEO for a company will depend on where you're in the life cycle. This has always been true. But there's something that's happened in the 21st century that I think that's going to make this process more painful. If you take a company like Ford, when it was a young growth company, Henry Ford ran it. Visionary, you might not like his vision. He, after all, he thought everybody should have a black car, Model T, only one model, one, one color. But he was the perfect CEO for Ford when it was a growing company. By the time... Ford got to be a more mature company. Time had taken care of issues. Henry Ford had died, so new CEO. In the 20th century, companies lasted for so long that essentially time took care of this transition. The classic 21st century company works in a compressed life cycle. I mean, I describe tech companies as aging in dog years. A 25-year tech company is like a 100-year manufacturing company. You see what this is going to create, right? You have this great CEO, takes the company public. It's a young tech company, Travis Kalaknik, the Yahoo's who created Yahoo. Great visionaries, but here's the problem. Seven years later, this company is now a large, mature company. The same person is in, at the top. 15 years later, it's a declining company. That CEO is still at the top. And what made this person a great CEO for a young company might not be what you needed when the company was building up. If you get a chance, read the history of BlackBerry, right? A company that came out of nowhere, soared, and then collapsed. Same management at the top. It was viewed as visionary and great in the first half of BlackBerry's life, and it's terrible in the second half. 
I, I, I'll make a prediction. I think you're going to see more and more companies, especially these tech companies, where a founder is celebrated as a superb visionary and a great CEO. 15 years later, you're going to say, I wish he wasn't running the company or she wasn't running the company. But here's what I think is going to make it even more difficult to deal with. What have most of these young tech companies done in the last 20 years we talked about in the context of corporate governance that kind of consolidates power in the founder CEO? Since 2004, when Google introduced two classes of shares, almost every tech company that's gone public has created voting and non-voting shares. We've created CEOs who are essentially dictators. And initially, we asked portfolio managers, why are you allowing Mark Zuckerberg to control Facebook with 57% of the voting rights when he has only 20% of the shares? Their response would have been, but he's a great CEO. He's the perfect CEO for the company. I'm sure some of them are having second thoughts now, but it's too late. You effectively conceded control up front, saying, this guy is a dictator, but he's a benevolent dictator. And now you're discovering that benevolent dictators can become malevolent dictators, and there's not a whole lot you can do about this. You're going to see this play out more and more at tech companies, where a founder is entrenched at the top as a CEO. And it's 10 years later and say, I wish we hadn't done that. So with that background, let's, let's kind of move towards wrapping up. So if you overreach as managers, there's a backlash, either activist investors or hostile acquisitions. Remember we talked about the Nabisco effect? Let me go back to what Nabisco did and why bondholders suffered. You bought Nabisco bonds thinking it was a nice, safe company, right? You bought it based on the AA rating. What is it that, you know, when Nabisco did the LBO, why were you so badly impacted? Because your interest rate was set on the base. It was a nice, safe company. And now it had become overnight, essentially a much riskier company. You were stuck with the old interest rate. That's why you saw that 20% drop in the bond price is because as a bondholder, you woke up to the recognition that you were unprotected. When this happened in the 1980s, bondholders woke up and he's saying, must have been retail. No, many of these bondholders were, put for, were institutional investors. I think Deutsche Bank might've been one of the biggest holders of Nabisco bonds when that fall happened. It's too late to do anything about Nabisco, but let's say it's now 1988 you're deciding to issue a bond and you're writing in covenants or protections against being Nabisco. Think of some of the things you could do. Merrill Lynch came up with a bond called a rating sensitive bond. What's a rating sensitive bond? Usually you set a coupon rate in a bond, you're stuck with it. Merrill actually created a bond where if the rating for the company changed, your coupon would automatically change. So if they'd had this with a Nabisco bond, when they went from AA to WB, your coupon rate would have gone from 7 to 12%. You'd have been protected. More and more bonds became convertible bonds. You're saying, how does that help me? What's happening here? Equity investors are ripping off bondholders, right? With a convertible bond, you know what I do? So you're trying to rip me off? I'll become one of you. That's what a conversion option allows you to do. People learn from the Nabisco bond and started putting in protections into bonds. It was too late to protect your Nabisco, but markets learned and adapted and adjusted. So stockholders, if, if managers overreach, activist investors and hostile acquisitions show up, bondholders start to build in protections into the new types of bonds that show up. Let's take the financial market. We talked about the leakage, which is companies sometimes hold back information from markets or outright lie. Let's take the outright lie first. Let's assume you commit fraud, you're covering up the numbers. The truth eventually comes out, right? It's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. And you all, you've all seen what happens when a company reports, hey guys, we were cooking the books. What's the first effect in markets when you learn that companies have been cooking the books? The stock price drops. 
and it stays low. You know why? Because you've lost all credibility. Remember we talked about the value of a business coming from two places, assets in place and growth assets. What is it that drives the value of growth assets? Expectations of what you will do in the future, right? What are those expectations based on? At least in some extent on what managers are telling you the plans are in the future. I'm not condoning mature companies committing fraud, but I've never understood young growth companies going on and playing games with their accounting numbers. Why would you do that? 80% of your values in growth assets, why would you risk that to deliver earnings per share that are five cents higher than expected? Groupon tried this early in their public company life. And I don't think they've fully recovered since. In fact, for the recovery to happen, when companies commit fraud, often the top management has to leave because the same management stays in place. It's almost impossible to get enough trust in markets to build up your price. So markets meet out punishment. It might be too late to protect you if you got caught in the fraud, but that punishment is so decisive and so long-term that you got to factor into your decision-making. And we did say markets can be irrational, do stupid things. You're right, prices can take off in directions you don't want them to go. But there again, the truth eventually comes out. I'm not suggesting there's no pain when there's correction, but there is a correction. And finally, if you think about societal backlash, here's the only part of ESG I buy it. If you're a company, I don't want you to walk too close to that line between good and bad, even if it's legal, right? Because as you contaminate your name, there could be long-term, I'm doing this pure, it's not a moralistic judgment, it's a business judgment, which is if you mess with your name by walking too close to the line, all you need is one small mistake, you're across the line, you might never be able to make it back again. In my valuations, I estimated a number called the failure rate, the chance of catastrophic risk at your company that could devastate the company. And to me, that is the number where I show my concerns about companies that are walking too close to the line. Valiant tried it in the mid middle part of the last decade, blew up. But there are other companies around the world where people say, that company's making a lot of money, but I don't like the way it's making money. So each of the, the limitations we talked about in, in stock price maximization, if you let the process play out, there will be a correction. So if I were to summarize my argument for a market-based objective, my argument is if you pick a market-based objective and you overreach, there will always be a correction. It'll clean that. I can't say the same thing about elitist-based objectives where managers set the objective or government set the objective. Remember what he said about elitists. If they make mistakes, they circle the wagons and they don't admit it. Markets have no egos. I mean, you can see the stock price drop by 90% in 15 minutes. Once markets recognize that there's something underneath that they don't like. So my argument for markets is not that they're right, but that they correct myself. So I'll give you my vision of what I think businesses should do. I call it constrained corporatism. Remember the robber baron vision of corporatism? You go out and you maximize earnings, take full advantage of every group. I think that's actually bad for long-term value. I mean, that's a mistake that Martin Tricoli did when he went out and said, hey, you know what? I should make the most money because that's what corporate finance tells me to do. No, that's not what corporate finance says. It should say maximize value, which is long-term earnings. In constrained corporatism, I wanted to focus on increasing earnings and increasing cash flows. But there will be times where you say, this project can deliver money for me, but I'm not going to do it because it makes me walk too close to the line. That's the constraint you put in. Businesses, sensible businesses, have always understood that these constraints are not constraints that are arbitrary, but constraints you impose because you care about long-term value. So I want you to treat employees well, not because 
not even because it's the right thing to do, but because those employees are what make you successful as a company. I want you to deliver products and services to customers that deliver a good deal for them because you want them to come back and keep buying your products and services. If this is what you mean by sustainability, we're on the same page, but I don't need a new buzzword to do this. This is essentially the end game of maximizing value playing out in restraining yourself on some decisions from going for the absolute best project and taking the next best one because you get close enough to your highest earnings, but you also protect yourself against all these side costs. As I said at the start of this discussion, I am not going to impose my objective on you. I mean, I believe that this notion that you can be all things to all people is not just unrealistic, but damaging. I think you need to have a primary group that is your, that's a group that you focus on. I think that group has to be shareholders, not because they're special, but because they're the only ones without protection. They don't have contracts. Having said that, I'm not going to tell you maximizing stock prices with no constraints is what you should do because that makes no sense to me. I'm going to let you build in constraints because for maximizing stock price with no constraints to make sense, all of those utopian objectives have to hold, right? Markets are efficient, lenders are protected, there are no social costs and benefits. That's not the world I live in. In fact, if you're the CEO of a company, in an emerging market where markets are extraordinarily illiquid. Not, I won't say irrational, but inefficient because they're illiquid. I'm going to say go out and maximize value and then try to get the stock price to catch up with the value. It might take a lot of convincing, but there are times where I'm going to pull back on maximizing stock prices because I don't trust markets. And if lenders are not protected, then I think it makes more sense to maximize the overall value of the business rather than let shareholders steal from bondholders in the short term and derive value. So here are your choices. You can go for, you know, within the share, within the, you can go for maximizing stock prices. It's clean, there's no constraints. You can go for maximizing stockholder wealth. Now, which might not be good because you don't trust markets to do the right thing. But that assumes that bondholders are protected or you can maximize firm value. If you're a private business, there's no stock price choice in the first place. I think it makes more sense to think about maximizing either stockholder or the firm value and saying, I'm going to do the right thing for the company in terms of increasing value. The market might not agree with me right now, but I'm okay. That's tough though, if you're the CEO of a company because your time horizon might not allow you to do the right thing because you might get fired before the right thing happens. So I'm not saying it's easy to do, but I think we need to kind of negotiate our way to, okay, what is the objective that I'm comfortable focusing on when I'm running a company? Yes. What do you think like uh, having those two classes of shares, for example, in Facebook allows for a company in terms of that horizon, though? No, wait. First, you're making an assumption that founders have long time horizons that what they do is for the best of the company. Right? No, no, but I'm saying, but it, you know, remember, all you're doing when you, when you allow a founder to have controlling interests is you're essentially letting the founder substitute judgments for the collective shareholders. Okay? So if you believe founders are much more long-term, that they are able to make decisions that are good for the company that they could not do if shareholders were voting, then you're absolutely right. In fact, this is the argument that many people in family group companies make, right? Which is we control this company, but we have long-term interests that we can put above shareholders. My reaction is show me. Yeah, because I don't believe that any group or subgroup of people have longer time horizons than others. So when people say we have longer time horizons, I'm going to look at the actions. So Mark Zuckerberg says, Give, leave me in control of the company because I'm doing what's best for Facebook in the long term. I'm not going to take him at his word. I'm just going to look at his actions and say, does that make sense? But here's the problem. Let's say it doesn't make sense. My question is, what do you do now? As shareholders, you've given up the power to replace management. 
You heard of Summer, Summer, Summer Redstone? He built up a company called Viacom. And when he built it up, he was viewed as one of the, one of the, one of the best CEOs. No. And he built a company where in Viacom, he had the voting shares, he had the voting rights. Take a look at how that story is unfolded 40 years later. He ended up with dementia. His daughter took over the firm because she had the voting right. And the company ended up in a complete and total mess and shareholders had absolutely no say in how the company was run. So when shareholders give up preemptively that right to change, it might be okay for the next three years, the next five, the next 10, but there will be a point where you regret not being able to contest. I mean, let's face it, even if Mark Zuckerberg had not had voting shares, with 22% of the shares, you're still owner of enough shares in the company that unless people are really angry with you, you're still going to run the company. It's just that he's loaded the dice by saying, even if 78% of the shareholders don't like me, I still want to be in control. And that's, I think, what troubles me, companies with voting shares, is just loaded the dice. Yes. I didn't start out with that presumption. I say, okay, they claim to increase value, show me where. And if you look at the collective evidence, I don't see where it is. I don't see it in the growth. I don't see it in the margins. I don't see it in the risk. At which point, when you say it is better for me, where, where is it? If it doesn't show up in the numbers. So, but the numbers are the same. Then I would buy the good company, right? Because the way it shows up is that failure risk. You, if they, the numbers are the same and you are in fact closer to that line of potentially catastrophic risk because you're, you're walking, I'd pick the good company. But the, the, you know, what if the, 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 the numbers are not the same? Would you be willing to pay for the good company even if it delivers lower earnings and less growth? That's where ESC seems to suggest that I should go for the company that is good and their promise is eventually these things are going to show up. It's just not there yet. Okay. There is, and, I, and I'm, I'm, that's what I'm asking them. Show me how it shows up in growth because you can't just tell me, trust me, margins are going to improve. Tell me how it's going to show up. Maybe you have a really good story about how treating your employees right means your turnover rates are low and over time you have more loyal employees and therefore you have lower costs. I'm willing to listen to any story. But right now I don't hear that. I just said, trust us. I mean, if you listen, if you read Larry Fink's latest, uh, you know, you wrote a piece about why, because he has a little bit of a problem, which is he's investing $11 trillion of other people's money. Let's be quite clear. Black, you know, Larry Fink is not investing his money. He's investing $11 trillion of other people's money in the form of ETFs and index funds. And guess who those other people are? They're often pensioners at companies who pick the BlackRock ETF to put their pension money in. And you have a fiduciary responsibility, right? Which is you take their money, you've got to deliver returns. You're not doing it to make the world a better place. So he had to come back with that second, you know, it was a few weeks ago where he said, I'm not investing in ESG because I care about society. I'm investing in ESG because it's good for companies. They will make, and I look for details. Tell me how. If you get a chance, read the statement. I don't see anything. I just trust me. I know. And this is from a guy who's actually never run a regular business. He's a fixed income guy who created a great fund and he bought the equity fund from Barclays. So why would I trust him? Why, why, you know, on what basis can I create the trust? So let's now talk about the meat and potatoes corporate finance. Now we've got that objective. It's really not out of the way. It's always lurking in the background. So that when you find yourself disagreeing with me over the next you know, 12 weeks or 13 weeks, ask yourself, am I disagreeing with what we're doing in terms of how you pick projects? Or am I disagreeing about what the end game is? Because that's where the disagreement comes from. So what I'd like to talk about for the rest of this session is that first piece 
of the investment principle. I said the hurdle rate should reflect the risk in an investment and where you raise the money, debt and equity. So the rest of today's class, I want to talk about this word risk. It's such a big word in finance. We talk about it all the time. Often, I don't think we have a sense of what we're talking about. So let me set the table. Here's what I'd like to be. You come to me with a project. I need a, some kind of benchmark, some number that I come up with for this project that the project has to be. That's what a hurdle rate is. It's a benchmark for a project. And here's how I'm going to try to build to it. I'm going to start with a riskless rate, and I'm not going to settle for it, right? Because the project is a risky project. I need to earn more than the riskless rate. So it's going to have a riskless rate plus a risk premium, which leaves us with two big questions to answer in corporate finance. One is we need to come up with a good measure of risk. And second, we need to be able to convert that risk measure into a risk premium. This is pragmatic. You can't just say riskier project, use a higher hurdle rate, then I ask you how much higher is that? I don't quite know, but just use a higher number. So you might not like the pathways we take to get from a measure of risk to risk premiums, but you need a risk premium to actually run a business. So I'm gonna start with that first question. What is risk? So I'm gonna throw the question out to you because you know, some of you worked in finance, may, all of you have taken the foundations class or are taking it right now. What is risk? Yes. I think one of the measures of risk is to get out. How quickly can you get out of something? How quickly you can get out. Doesn't matter what price you get out at. You can always get out of anything really quickly. The question is how much you leave on the table if you get out, right? So your definition of risk is defined in terms of if something bad happens, how quickly can I get out and how much will I lose when I get out? Anybody else? Yes. I would say it's uncertainty about future events. Which means I've replaced one fuzzy word with another fuzzy word, right? I mean, risk, uncertainty. And if I ask you what uncertainty is, we can go back and use it. So I agree with you, it's uncertainty about future events. Let me push you on it though. Are you, a, you know, when you think about uncertainty about future events, uncertainty can cut in both ways. Sometimes the actual can be better than you expected. Sometimes it's worse. I mean, let's face it, as human beings, which one of those do we call risk? Downside, right? So much as we think about the upside as part of what we measure, the reality is nobody complains about their stock being risky if it's up 80%. So already we're starting to see that, you know, first people define risk often in downside. And that's in fact, the, 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 also the definition of how quickly can I get out? But uncertainty and risk can cut both ways. If you define risk purely in terms of downside, you're gonna have a problem, and here's why. If risk is a bad thing, then what should you do as a business? Avoid risk. In fact, that's become the basis for risk management, right? We'll tell you how to reduce risk and avoid risk, and that's a really dangerous place to be as a business if your end game is, I want to avoid risk or minimize risk. Or let me, in fact, to illustrate that, I'm gonna reframe the question. How many great companies do you see around you that became great by avoiding risk? In fact, if you're a great company, what do you do? You found a risk where you had an advantage and you went out there and exploited the risk. I know it's difficult to think of the upside, but for, to, for, to consider risk sensibly, you got to bring in both upside and downside. So I'm going to give you my favorite definition of risk. And it's actually not a definition I came up with. But if you think about a good risk and return model, if you think about a good measure of risk, it's a Chinese symbol for crisis. You know how many times I've been corrected on this symbol? I've been using it for 30 years. Every time I put it up, somebody from China will email me saying, that's not the right symbol. It's supposed to be this way. I've given up. I've been told that this is the Chinese symbol for crisis. It could be something obscene for all I know, since I don't know Chinese. And the Chinese symbol for crisis is a combination of two symbols. It's a symbol for danger plus the symbol for, for opportunity. Risk is danger plus opportunity. It's a perfect way to think about risk because it locks them at the hip. What does it tell you? If you want one, you got to live with the other. Which of these two 
do we seek out? We want opportunity, right? Every one of us wants to make 50% returns. And this equation or this symbol reminds you if you want to make 50% returns, hey, whoever's on Zoom with your mic on, could you please mute it? If you want to make 50% returns, be willing to live with a lot of danger. Think of how many scams would never get off the ground if people remembered this linkage. What's the essence of a scam? I come to you and say, you can make 15% returns with no risk. And you fall for it every single time, right? Because even though it sounds too good to be true, it's like that Nigerian email offering you $15 million to just send your bank account. I'm not picking on Nigeria. It could be an email from anywhere. But it sounds too good to be true. You've been told don't fall for it, but you fall for it every single time. In fact, if you're a clever scam artist, you don't offer 15, you offer eight. Is it not that greedy? I'm just offering. That's a Bernie Madoff magic, right? For a decade, that's how Bernie Madoff collected all that money. But just to illustrate what happens when people forget this linkage. Anybody here from Orange County, California? Okay. The wealthiest counties in the US, home to Disneyland. But about 25 years, maybe 30 years ago, Orange County declared bankruptcy. You know why? Because the treasurer of Orange County had decided to take 30% of the Orange County employee pension fund and make a bet on interest rates in Germany. Don't ask me you know, to dig any deeper. Made the bet, lost the money. Huge scandal. He's on 60 Minutes. This treasurer's name was Bob Citron. Now, I think everybody in Southern California invents a name. Bob Citron, you know, Orange County, Citron. I mean, it sounds too, it's like, you know, Wolf Blitzer. You really believe that that guy's name is Wolf Blitzer, defense correspondent? He used to be defense. I think he made up the name because it sounded like what a defense correspondent should have as a name. So Bob Citron is his treasure. So he's on 60 Minutes. He's being interviewed by Mike Wallace, legendary interviewer. So Mike Wallace asks Bob Citron, Mr. Citron, why would you take pension fund money that's supposed to be invested in something safe and speculate in interest rates in Germany? And here's what Bob Citron says. He says, because Charlie Claude told me I could make 15% with no risk, which your response is, who the heck is Charlie Claude and why is he telling you these things? Charlie Claude was market strategist for Merrill Lynch. Then. Merrill, in fact, ended up becoming a co-defendant in the lawsuit that came out of this. But I don't for a minute believe that Charlie Claude would have told him this. You know why? Not because I know Mr. Claude personally, but because he's a market strategist. If any of you have ever worked in an investment bank and listened to a market strategist talk, these are the most slippery people on the face of the earth. They're incapable of making a direct statement. You could have a one hour talk and at the end of the hour I ask you, what did he say again? Did he say markets would go up? No, I think he mentioned that. He said markets would go down. I think he mentioned that too. He said markets could stay where they are. I think he threw that in as well. No matter what happens, you're covered. But maybe Charlie Clow got drunk and he told Citroen, you can make 15% no risk. Let's go back to the interview. Here's Bob Citroen following up. He said, Charlie Clow told me I could make 15% with no risk and I'm not a finance person. Remind me again what your job title is, treasurer of a county. I thought, no, I was mistakenly assuming that that had something to do with finance, but it turned out to be an elected position. He's a very good politician. But let me ask you a question. Do you need to be a finance person to know that if somebody walks up to you and says, you can make 15% with no risk, they're lying. In fact, if you fall for that pitch, you probably also think that that Rolex you bought on Canal Street for $40 is actually a Rolex. Let me promise you, it is not a Rolex. In fact, look at the spelling. It says R-O-L-E-C-K-S. Sometimes bad things happen when you misspell. You pay $40 for a watch, it's not a Rolex. But 
it's easy to fall for this because you want to make the 15% and you want there to be no risk. So one way to think about every, the way we, we're gonna approach the dealing of risk in, in, in finance is we're gonna to try to measure the danger in an investment. That's what risk is. And then we're gonna ask how much opportunity will I need to compensate for taking, for exposing myself to this danger. We don't seek out risk for the, take of, for the sake of taking risk in finance. We're not bungee jumpers or mountain climbers. We take risk because we hope to get a reward. Of course, we could be disappointed in hindsight, but walking into an investment, if there's risk, you need to make enough of a return to cover that risk. So every risk and return model in finance, that's our task, to measure the risk and to ask how much return do I need to make to compensate me for taking the risk. So let me list out what a good risk and return model would do. First, it should come up with a measure of risk that's universal. You know what I mean by universal? The risk measure should work for all types of stocks, not just for stocks, it should work for bonds, for real estate, because I, as an investor, can invest in any of those. So a good risk measure, I should be able to apply across all kinds of investments. Second, it should very clearly list out for me what types of risk will get rewarded and what types of risk will not get rewarded. You're saying, why would I ever not get rewarded for taking on risk? I'll give you a very simplistic and stupid example. If you decide to buy a house, across from your brokerage where you go and trade, but it's six, it's across a highway. And every day you get up and you run across the highway. You're exposed to a lot of risk, right? But don't expect to get rewarded for taking that risk. I know that sounds absurd, but there are risks in businesses you're going to get rewarded for and risk you're not. And a good risk and return model will draw the line for you. Third, once you've defined the risk, I'd like to get a standardized risk measure. What I mean by standardized risk measure is if I give you this number, you can just look at the number and say that is above average risk or below average risk. I'll give you two, you know, for instance, a number that doesn't meet that test. You know, people often talk about the standard deviation in stock prices as a measure of risk. What if I told you the standard deviation in your company's stock price is 36%? And then I said, is that a risky stock? I have no idea. 36% could be high low. So the risk measure that I need to give you is a number that you can look at. That, hey, that is an above average risk investment. That's about average risk. That's below average risk. Fourth, that risk measure should translate into a hurdle rate. Don't forget the end game. We're not measuring risk because we want to measure risk, but because we want to convert into a hurdle rate. And finally, there's this fifth requirement. It's a pain in the neck, but I've got to throw it in. Anyway, it's got to work, right? It's got to work in the sense over time, if I take investments that you say are high risk, they should deliver higher returns. So after the fact, looking back, okay, that worked. So that's what a good risk and return model would do for me. I'm gonna show you the risk and return model from which corporate finance gets most of its practical use. It's called a capital asset pricing model. You've seen it in your foundations class. I have zero interest in deriving it, but let's first pass it through the test of the good risk and return model. And then we'll look at the, you know, whether there's, there are alternatives and things I can do better. It use, so the capital asset pricing model operates in what's called the mean variance framework. It sounds fancy, but when you look at investments, says you look at two dimensions, the expected return, that's the good stuff, and the variance in returns, which is the bad stuff. So it measures risk in terms of variance in returns around an expected return. So I'll give you a few examples in a few minutes so you can see that play out. So it measures variance. Second, it says only the portion of that variance you cannot diversify away is going to get rewarded. You might say, why, why is that? Because you can always diversify. Nobody has an excuse for not being diversified. You say, what if I only $100? Buy an index fund then. When you choose to concentrate your portfolio and buy four or five companies, it's a choice you made. You shouldn't expect the market to reward you for that choice. You might still make enough returns because you're such a good stock picker, but the risk that is going to get measured is the risk you cannot diversify. Third, 
it's going to measure that non-diversifiable risk with one number. We call it a beta, but you can call it whatever you want. But the nice thing about a beta is when I tell you the beta for a stock is 1.23, and then I ask you, is this stock riskier than the market or safer? The answer is obvious, right? Your beta is above one, you're riskier. The beta is below one, you're safer. Your beta is above one, your average is standalone. And once I have the beta for your stock, I can get the expected return by starting with the risk-free rate and then taking the beta for your stock and multiplying by what the price of risk is in the equity market for an average risk stock. It's called an equity risk premium. A lot of practical estimation challenges there, but I can convert to a hurdle rate. This is great, right? It's meeting all the requirements. But now let me come to that fifth component. It works at least as well as the next best model. This is damning with faint praise, right? I'd say it works well. It says it works at least as well as the next best model. So let me take you through a very quick derivation of the cap. I and mean, as I said, this is not the way you probably saw in foundations, but this is the way I want to think about it, think about it intuitively. So the first step in this model is I define risk as variance of actual returns or unexpected returns. Sounds abstract. So let me give you four different investments. And as I go through the four, and I want you to think, I want you to think about variance in each of these. Let's assume you're an investor with a one-year time horizon who buys a one-year T-bill. And for the moment, let's assume that there's no default risk in the US Treasury. So when you buy the investment, you're going to observe the rate, right? Right now, a one-year T-bill, the rate is about 0.2%. You go out and you put your money in the table. You hold it for a year, a year from now, when I come and knock on your door and ask you, what did you make on this table? What's your answer always going to be? You're going to make 0.2%. There's no default risk. You held it for the year. You're going to make exactly what you predicted you would make with certainty. That is a riskless investment. You think that's because it's a treasury. To show you that not all treasuries are riskless, if you bought a 10-year T-bond with a one-year time horizon, there's risk, right? Why, why is there risk? You know exactly what your coupon rate is going to be for the next year, but at the end of the year, what could happen? The price of the bond could change, right? Because interest rates can change. Hold on to that, but when you get, come to risk-free rates, I'm gonna draw on that principle. So it's variance of actual returns or unexpected returns. Let's move one step up the ladder. If it's a corporate bond, there's more uncertainty. Why? In addition to interest rates changing, what else could change? Your, co your company could default. The essence of companies is they might default. So corporate bond is riskier than a treasury bond. Let's move into the stock market. Let's say you buy Con Ed. Con Ed is a utility. It pays a solid dividend. It's a fairly safe stock. But there's even more risk than you had in the T-bond or the corporate bond, because now at the end of the next year, when I come and say, how much do you make on this? Your actual return. So if your expected return was 8% on Con Ed, you could make 15% if it's a good year. And you might actually lose 3% if it's a bad year. Much more variance. And finally, let's assume that you now believe that Facebook is cheap enough that you're ready to buy it at 225. What do you expect to make? Let's say you expect to make 12%. You've raised your hurdle rate because it's riskier. If you're lucky, a year from now and come and knock on your door, what could have happened? Facebook could double in price, right? It's done that before. And if you're not, it could have in price. Not all stocks have the same amount of risk because depending on the stock, the range of actual returns or unexpected returns can get much greater. But in every single one of these examples, when I talked about risk, it was always about what will happen in the next year, the next five years. It's stating the obvious, but there is no risk in the past. You know why? Because it's already happened. You know, I'm belaboring that point. Because when I ask you how risky is Con Ed, how risky is Facebook? You know what we're trained to do in finance to measure risk? We can't look into the future, so we look backwards. Every measure of risk we have in finance comes from looking backwards, but risk is forward-looking. We're gonna come back, and we're gonna to have to come back and deal with this. 
when we talk about measuring risk because a backward looking measure might not be a good proxy for what our future risk is. You think, what do I do? There are things you can do, but it's good to be aware. So when you ask me how risky is Disney, I can show you what its uh, returns have done. And you can look over time, there's, you know, the, and this is monthly returns going back from 2008 to 2013. The average monthly return was 1.65%, but the average monthly standard deviation was about 7.65%. Again, if I just gave you that number, it's the high number or low number, you have no, you know, no perspective. But if you look at stock returns, you see risk play up in terms of the actual returns kind of deviating around. The fact that the average expected return was positive is good news, but you can see there were months in which you made not just worse than your average return, but big negative returns. So one of the first places to start to look at risk is by looking at this history of returns on your stock. You can pull this up from Yahoo Finance and do it yourself. It's not difficult to do, but it's going to give you your first perspective or am I looking at a volatile stock? And sometimes it's good to put two stocks in the same graph, right? So if you take a Con Ed and Facebook and put them in the same graph, you can see how much more volatile some stocks are than others. Any questions about, yeah. but you can already see that the CAPM decides there are only two things you care about in investment. What's my expected return? What's the variance? The expected return is good. The variance is bad. That's why it's called the mean variance framework. And I'm gonna start off by pointing to a problem with that framework with a very simple example. Let's assume you're an investor and I come to you with two investments. They have the same expected return and the same standard deviation. So if you lived in the CAPM world, you know what I would tell you, right? You're indifferent between the two, there's, there. but here's where I'm gonna make it interesting. So there's no right answer. I want you to think about what your choice would be. So here's the first thing. And the, even though these investments have the same expected return standard deviation, the best you can do on investment A is to make a 60, is, 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 you know, is to make, the, I'm sorry, the best you can do on investment B is to make a 60% return. But on investment A, there's a small chance, a very tiny chance that you could quadruple your money. So basically what I've done is I've given you two investments with the same expected return, the same standard deviation. But investment A, you could quadruple your money with a very tight, because it's already reflect the expected return, tiny chance for investment B, the best you could do is 60%. How many of you would still be indifferent between A and B now that I've thrown this into the mix? There's one person in this class who lives in the CAPM world. Because in the CAPM world, you should be. How many of you would prefer investment A over investment B? In fact, it's called preference for skewness. Every time you walk in and buy a lottery ticket, think of what your expected return is. The state is actually pretty open. It takes away half of your, so it's a minus 50% return. So if you think in financial terms, why would I do that? It's because you get this tiny chance of earning $300 million or $100 million. So already something to factor in. When I use the CAPM and the mean variance model, I might be over, when I look at the expected return on a stock, I might be missing the fact that there are some stocks where you get a very large chance, or a very small chance of a huge payoff. And those stocks, investors might settle for lower expected returns because of that potential. Small cap stocks over large cap stocks. Young growth stocks over mature companies. So let's go back to the original example, 15% expected return, 25% standard. We've seen that skewness matters, the chance of getting a big positive outcome. Let me add a second layer of differences. Let's assume that there's a small possibility that you will now lose, that you will lose 100% of your money with investment A. Very tiny, but the worst you can do in investment B is lose 50%. How many of you would pick investment B because your worst case scenario is a little better with B than A? Anybody? And this is, I think, another factor. Some risk averse people think about worst case scenarios, which goes beyond looking at the expected return standard deviation. What I'm trying to say is 
The CAPM is built on this premise that people care about expected return and standard deviation. And for companies where there are these chances of huge outcomes in either direction, your choice might be affected by the likelihood of those outcomes. And that might show up in what kind of expected returns you demand on those projects. Now, let me talk about what I think is the real revolution that finance has brought to thinking about risk. In the early 1950s, there was a PhD student at Princeton called Harry Markowitz. In the early 50s, the way people thought about risk was in terms of standard deviation. They said, companies that have higher standard deviation are riskier than companies with lower standard deviation. And Harry was in the, in the library one day and he, he had five different stocks and he started just on paper because there were no computers then. Then I start, what would happen if I had all five stocks in my portfolio? And he discovered something that people in statistics have always known, which is the law of large numbers, which is when you combine stocks in a portfolio, there are some kinds of risk that essentially will start to disappear. Why? Because they average out. And I'll give you an intuitive basis for thinking about it. Let's suppose I put my money in Disney. Think about all of the risks I'm exposed to. There are risks specific to projects. Disney recently opened a very expensive theme park in Shanghai. And China has always been a puzzle, a tough market for Disney because the you know, Avengers movies don't seem to do well in China. They have always... So when they spent the $3 billion or $5 billion they spent on Shanghai, there was no guarantee they could make that money, but it's a big market. So that theme park could do much better than expected or much worse than expected. That is risk that affects only Disney. In other words, it is risk very specific to the company because it's project risk affects Disney. Let's move up the ladder. Disney is part of the broadcasting business. Congress is thinking about changing laws and how broadcasting is run. Guess what? Disney is going to be affected, but so, is, and so are all the other. So now we've gone from risk that affects just Disney to risk that affects maybe five or seven or nine companies. Let's move further up the list. Disney is an entertainment company. The degree that technology changes the way the business is running. Netflix, for instance, has clearly changed the business. Every company in the sector not just Disney is going to be affected, but it's going to be maybe 50, 70, 80 companies. You might say, why are you emphasizing how many companies are affected? There's a reason I'm doing it. Because as you go to the fact that Disney has a lot of foreign operations, every time the dollar strengthens or weakens, Disney is affected, but so are maybe a thousand companies with big exposures outside. And for those of you who have not been keeping up with the news, next week there's going to be an FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee meeting. We'll wage your market will come to a complete standstill. There's a very real chance that if that committee meeting ends with the Fed saying, you know what, inflation is out of control, it's going to be a very bad day, two days, maybe an entire year. And guess what? If that happens, it's not just Disney, it's not just the entertainment sector, it's not just US stocks, it's global stocks that are going to be affected. All stocks are affected when interest rates change. If you put all your money in Disney, let's say you decide that Disney is a great company to buy, Disney Plus is working, you can take everything and put in, you're exposed to all those risks, right? So if you're an investor who puts all your money in one company, all these risks kind of melt together. Or if you're a private business owner, and you're looking at risk, you might say, I'm exposed to all those risks. But as you start to diversify, and you hold not just Disney, but 10 or 15 or 25 or 50 companies, something almost magical starts to happen, which is those risks that affect one or a few firms start to average out. You know what I mean by average out? Try this out. I have, you know, I have about 50 stocks in my portfolio. And reading the Wall Street Journal, which I sometimes do, is like going on a roller coaster. On page one, there's news about a stock, which is good news for one of my stocks. I said, that's good, 3M went up. Two pages later, I read about another stock in my portfolio. The CEO's developed some serious mental issues and the stock price is down 20%, bad news. By the time I finished reading the paper, there are probably news stories on 12 different companies in my portfolio. And unless God has it out for me, 
in which case nothing can be predicted. Risk that affect one or a few companies is going to average out, if not on every day across time. That is the basis for diversification. It's not some magic. You can prove it statistically with correlations and covariances, but you're talking about the fact that risk that affects one or a few companies averages out. So the weak argument for it is each investment is only a small piece of my portfolio. The stronger argument is statistics, the law of large numbers, things will average out across your portfolio. So when you think about diversification, that is the argument for diversification. And here's where I'm gonna introduce what I think is one of the key components of corporate finance. When you look at the risk in a company, when you imagine a company, the risk that you have to think about is the risk that is seen by the marginal investor in your company. So who the heck is a marginal investor? The marginal investor actually is the investor most likely to affect prices. And I'll make a confession. I told you I own shares in 50 companies. I'm not a marginal investor in any of them. You know why? I don't have enough money. I mean, how the heck are you going to have, be a marginal investor in Apple when you have a $3 trillion company, the fact that you bought 1,000 shares, 10,000, or even a million shares, nobody cares. So I'll give you what you need for an investor to be a marginal investor, and we'll end for today. For, a marginal for somebody to be a marginal investor, they have to own a lot of shares. And what a lot of shares will be will be, will be different if you're a $3 trillion company or a $3 billion company, but you've got to be a big shareholder. And second, you have to train those shares. Here's a strange irony. Mark Zuckerberg is not the marginal investor in Facebook. He owns a lot of shares, but he doesn't trade them. Larry Ellison is not the marginal investor in Oracle. He owns a lot of shares, but he doesn't trade them. You need to have investors who own a lot of shares and trade them. So I'll leave you with the final question. You take any large publicly traded company, you look for investors who own a lot of shares and trade them. Who do you think is going to make that list? It's not you, it's not me, it's not the founders. It's probably going to be BlackRock or State Street or Fidelity. And that's what we're going to start with next session is when you look at risk in a company through the eyes of one of those investors, what is the risk you're going to see? Because that is the risk I as a manager should be bringing to my hurdle. So I will leave you with that thing with, to think about who that marginal investor is. And next session, we'll talk about how to find out who that investor is for your company.